All right, I think we are getting cued to start here, so uh, we'll jump in here and uh, make good use of your time. I know uh, we're all running around between as many sessions as we can pack in. Uh, real quick introductions. Uh, I'm Chris Nelson from SwiftStack. This is Kenny uh, Grip from Percona. Uh, we'll share time a little bit just so you know what the next 30 minutes is going to look like. Um, obviously, the topic, uh, as, as you have in the abstract or in the title and on the screen right now, is uh, um, using Percona's software to back up MySQL databases to Swift. That's the specific uh, topic we're going to talk about. To kind of set the stage, I'm going to take the first seven, eight, maybe 10 minutes and talk a little bit about Swift, OpenStack Swift, and what SwiftStack uh, kind of does in that space. I know Kenny is going to talk through for his five or 10 minutes around Percona and the software and kind of why back up. Uh, and then in the last 10 minutes of, of the first 30 or so, uh, the intent is to do a demonstration, right? So we'll actually show using uh, Percona software to back up OpenStack databases into Swift. We'll see that live up here uh, as we go. Should save a little time for Q&A, but don't hold us to it if, uh, if it runs a little bit long. <laughs> so with that, I'll jump right in uh, and, and kind of move along quickly. Real quick, if you don't know Swift or SwiftStack, that's what I want to hit for the next couple of minutes. SwiftStack as a company, we're in the, the hall, obviously. Uh, come on by and see us if you want. SwiftStack is a couple of things. One, we are the lead contributor to OpenStack Swift, a project that many of you know and hopefully love. It's been a part of OpenStack since its inception. Uh, we are based in San Francisco. Uh, John Dickinson, who many of you know, uh, project technical lead, works at our company. So do several of the core developers and a whole bunch of other people um, who are, are in the business of making Swift, OpenStack Swift, the world's most scalable object storage, most widely deployed object storage, um, easy to use in kind of an enterprise scenario, right? So we've got um, OpenStack Swift. If you're not familiar with that, the project, real quick rundowns of a couple things here. One, it's in use everywhere. There's no more widely deployed um, open source based or, or really any, any uh, object storage in the world. HP's public cloud, IBM, Rackspace, Oracle, any of the Swift stack deployments and many of these are, are based on Swift and are running Swift. So it's a very well proven uh, technology. <coughs> Tons of developers are scattered around here who have contributed in major ways and some of these company names that, uh, that you see here have been, been a big part along with SwiftStack and kind of moving this forward. Uh, if you missed it today, just a quick plug for Joe Arnold who I think is back here somewhere. Uh, the book that, that Joe and a bunch of the team at SwiftStack wrote on Swift, uh, we've been giving away. He did a book signing today. I think we've got another one tomorrow. So swing by the booth if you want more details. If you want to feel for where Swift has been deployed in, in the real world, not just in a, you know, somebody's uh, OpenStack, uh, POC in their lab, real world deployments both in the public space and private, private space, I mean it's everywhere, right? No question about uh, how, how well proven it is. Not every one of these is a SwiftStack customer. Some of these are clearly using uh, OpenStack Swift. Uh, the distinction uh, we can talk about a, another time. But real quick, what does SwiftStack do in addition to or, or beyond what you can go and get from GitHub uh, with OpenStack Swift, of course, which is an open, open source project? In the OpenStack community, you know, one of the marketing taglines we talk about is making Swift enterprise ready. The, the things down here in the bottom, we'll get to this, a, a little bit of detail here uh, in the bottom, the OpenStack Swift gray and black kind of section, that's what you get with core open source OpenStack Swift, right? You get a RESTful API, you get a, a, the scalability across uh, geographies and continents that, that's not a, a byproduct of its eventually consistent nature. You get the fact that it can be deployed on anything that you can run OpenStack on, right? Commodity or industry standard hardware, any x86 hardware out there, um, and more. Uh, you get concurrency, the performance capabilities, and all the rest. That's part of OpenStack Swift, whether you talk to, to SwiftStack or not. What we do is add pieces on top of that that are, are more or less required in the enterprise space. So obviously we provide support, that's a big part of it. Um, but also uh, our, our SwiftStack controller is a management tool that sits in front of this and provides simplified uh, deployment, management, monitoring, integration with things like LDAP authentication, Nagios, Zabbix, right? Provide a file system gateway, so if you have applications that don't yet talk to a RESTful API, the Swift API, but they know NFS or SIFs, so you can go through a gateway to get your data into a Swift cluster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That's the value add that SwiftStack brings on. I don't want this to be a sales pitch for SwiftStack, so I'll keep it, uh, keep it brief. With that, we'll stop SwiftStack, and I want to jump back into a bit about how Swift actually works, because this is going to be relevant to the part Kenny's going to talk through about um, actually using Swift as the target for backups, and specifically MySQL backups. So if, hopefully this is not new to anybody in the room here, but in case it is, real quick, an API, right, RESTful API, every object that is placed inside of Swift object storage, imagine an object being 
a picture and its associated metadata, right? You walk out there, you take a picture of an airplane, a seaplane taking off. Uh, it's been, it was taken in Vancouver, it has a name, right? It, it was uh, uh, taken on your iPhone 6 or whatever the case may be. You apply a little bit more metadata, it was my OpenStack Vancouver trip. All of that, the picture plus its metadata makes up an object. Every object in Swift is referenced by a URL, right? And it includes pieces like you see on the screen here, the, the container or the, uh, excuse me, the cluster that, the Swift cluster that it is in, plus a couple of additional pieces here that can help kind of sort out where it's going, a container, uh, uh, account, container, and object. I don't have time to get into lots of details there. Um, but we can talk about that more a bit later. So everything gets referenced via an API, right? When you're putting data in, when you're writing data into Swift, you are writing uh, via HTTP puts, right? The op uh, operation that you would expect. And when you are reading data back, you're using HTTP gets, right? To this, uh, uh, and there are some additional API calls as well. So what does the data path look like, right? I make a call to the, the cloud or the, my Swift stack uh, object storage at that URL. Now what actually happens? What are the pieces that are in play? I'm gonna get to a hardware slide in a minute so people can get their heads wrapped around this. Number one, the client, which in this case is gonna be Percona's extra backup tool. The client is gonna communicate with, if it's a large enough cluster, probably a load balancer, right, that's gonna handle the traffic coming from uh, a variety of clients and, and point them to a, a, a tier, if you will, or a, a proxy service. The proxy service is this traffic cop, if you will, that says, okay, a client request comes in, I need to go put a piece of data, and I've got potentially thousands of disks, potentially hundreds or thousands of nodes scattered around the world, I know where that data should go, and, you know, or on the flip side, I know where that data should be, I'll go and retrieve it. So you can scale in a Swift cluster independently this proxy tier, this kind of traffic manager, if you will, tier, from the actual, uh, you can scale it independently from the, um, the storage nodes that are you're really holding that data. So we spread, we use a, a, an algorithm, if you will, inside of Swift and Swift Stack when we kind of set all this stuff up. We, we will take the smallest deployment you give us, three drives, and, and we'll spread the data as uniquely as we can across those to give you the, you know, we emphasize availability over uh, almost anything else in that sense. You give us a small cluster of a handful of nodes, a large cluster, or even a multi-data center cluster, a multi-region or multi-continent cluster, and we'll take that data uh, that you give us and make sure that you have uh, available, uh, availability, even if you lost a continent or a network uh, partition or anything like that along the way. Real quick, one other feature that's relevant, especially in the backup space, uh, if you heard kind of buzz from Swift, right, the OpenStack Swift project last summit when we were in Paris, um, we were talking about that in kind of the previous one. We are talking a lot about storage policies. Storage policies is new features that a lot of companies collaborated in uh, to, to put into Swift that allow us to say, I'm gonna segregate um, the devices that are participating. Again, thousands of devices from different ages and, and different uh, characteristics, you know, SSDs, flash drive, or uh, spinning drives, big and small. I can put them all into the same cluster and I can segregate parts of those and say, this is kind of a high performance chunk of stuff this is a, uh, a you know, high density chunk of stuff, or this is my European Union uh, uh, physical hardware, so all the EU data is gonna be stored there, or this is a, you know, the news that uh, Swift has, has made, this, this uh, um, summit is erasure coding, right, is now available in Swift, so maybe I'm gonna store my backup data in an erasure coded uh, container, but there's other stuff that's serving kind of a, a you know, more tier one web application. I want that to be in a, a replica-based uh, container as well. Storage policies is what allows us um, to do that. So busy slide, don't worry about the details. I know all this stuff will be posted later, but real quickly to give you a feel for Swift can be deployed on a variety of industry standard hardware. A common reference architecture, these are flexible. This is not a hard and fast rule. Common set of reference architecture, you can kind of see on the left-hand side what it looks like to piece together some you know, memory and RAM and, and uh, CPU and networking. And then you can see that this can apply across a whole range of, of vendors that are uh, uh, out there providing the hardware that's in your data centers today. Last piece for me before I get Kenny up here, common ways that Swift is used. Obviously today's conversation specifically around uh, backups and by backups of MySQL in particular, but Swift is used uh, in, in, a, in a wide variety of ways. Our Swift and Swift Stack customers range from the backup and archive space, which we're talking about, um, down to kind of your enterprise Dropbox, right? Think file, sync and share, box.com, uh, backup or, or, or storage. Obviously, anybody that's using or has known OpenStack for a while knows that Swift is a natural thing to use for your glance images or your cinder backups. 
Um, and then we're, we spend a lot of time with customers in the M&E and the genomics kind of bioinformatics uh, spaces and, and beyond. Um, so that's a real fast rundown. Uh, I think there's a link on the last slide. So just the last thing I will say, and then I'll hand it over to Kenny, is that if you want more details on SWIFT specifically, uh, we've got a workshop running. I think it's about six hours on Friday, free uh, to any OpenStack attendee this week. You're welcome to come, and we'll go into all of that stuff in, in a lot more detail and give you chances to get some hands-on with software. So with that, um, to Percona and, and Percona's backup. Thank you, uh, Chris. OK, first of all, a little bit about Percona. Um, who does know about Procona? I kind of want a question. I kind of want a knee. Who, who has heard about Procona? Great, majority. I like it. OK, good. So it's a company founded in 2006 by former MySQL employees. So we are um, privately funded. We have a lot of customers worldwide. Um, I'm one of the Belgian employees. We have a lot of employees all over the world. I think it's about 30 countries at this time. Um, so we focus about around MySQL services or, uh, and, and beyond. Um, so here's a list of some of our customers. I think, um, yeah, uh, you can see it in the slides later on. Um, but uh, here is the thing is the most important thing uh, is what software we provide. We do a lot of open source software. So a lot of the things we create, if not almost everything, we make open source. So we have our own MySQL version called Percona Server. So it's a patched Oracle MySQL version with added diagnostics, added uh, performance benefits. It's more suited towards the cloud uh, environments, uh, things like that. We also have an ExtraDB cluster, which might be known by some. Who's using Percona ExtraDB cluster in OpenStack? Nobody? Galera cluster, maybe? Yeah, some of them. OK, great. So this is actually bringing synchronous uh, replication uh, to the MySQL uh, world, so where you can have better high availability uh, consistency um, in, in a MySQL uh, yeah, uh, cluster. So another thing we have is Procona Extra Backup, and that's where I'll focus on a little bit today. This is an online hot backup uh, for InnoDB storage engine, which you're most likely to use anyway. So this is where we're going to talk about today, how we can take backups. So it has the name Procona Extra Backup, but it does also support different uh, MySQL flavors, and I'll show you that later on. We also have Procona Toolkit, which is like a set of open source scripts that help to manage your day-to-day -day life as a developer or uh, operational person to like fix replication, fix inconsistencies automatically, do get some certain metrics out of it and everything. We also now have a, something completely different. So we're not only MySQL anymore. Uh, we have Procona Toku MX, which is a MongoDB uh, distribution, which is, uh, brings multi-version concurrency control transactions to MongoDB. And it has a very good compression ratio, and it has improved write performance. So maybe it's good to check it out if you're using MongoDB. Um, so uh, we do more. So we do more. We, we also do OpenStack services, uh, Linux, Hadoop, Vertica. We, we kind of tailor to, towards the general uh, uh, cloud uh, and everything. So um, yeah, we basically try to focus on what our customers uh, yeah, want us to do. Like we, we, the features we make in Procona Server are features that is really necessary, that our customers really need, that we see that are kind of problematic. We try to optimize it, bring it together, bring it open source, and release it for everybody. And this is one of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So here's an image about uh, OpenStack core services. It's a little bit outdated. But what you can see is we've got all these kind of st services like Glance, Nova, Cinder, Neutron, Keystone, maybe. They all have a database. And in majority of the cases, this database is MySQL. Who is not using MySQL? Um, as some of these databases. Who is using MySQL? Yeah, only a few? OK, uh, and as core service. OK, so here's one of the OpenStack user committee surveys from 2014. And you can see that the database usage, in, if we look at it, uh, all the ones with the arrows are actually MySQL-related products. So we're talking about about 68% is using MySQL. So the majority of uh, the people use MySQL from Oracle. Uh, then we've got MariaDB, which is a fork of MySQL. It's still compatible, it uses the same MySQL protocol, has different functionality, different features, but it's basically kind of MySQL still, right? So we have MySQL with Galera, Procona XDB cluster, and MariaDB Galera cluster. They're all built uh, upon that synchronous replication uh, technique built by a company named Codership. So this is uh, different flavors or different distributions of that software. 
We also have MySQL with DRBD, which is still used a little bit, and then we have Percona Server, uh, which is about 3% of the installation. So if we think about it, 70% of everybody using OpenStack is using MySQL. So backups, anyone? No? Who is not doing backups at the moment? Everybody's, oh, well, one person, okay. <laughs> uh, one person is not doing backups. So this is kind of an important thing. We need to do backups, because if we don't backup that data, of course, you will have uh, maybe a problem bringing your OpenStack to, uh, back again. Maybe uh, all, all the important data is there. So if I go back, we're talking about Nova, Cinder, Neutron, uh, maybe Keystone. All this information is stored in MySQL. So if we think about a, a decent backup architecture, what do we do? So we have, this is kind of general uh, backup uh, uh, recommendations, I would say. So what are your business requirements? What is the recovery time objective? How fast do you need to be able to restore? This is an important thing when you to kind of create backups. Many people just take a backup to some other file system, so they do it manually, extra backup, maybe stream it to another host or to another file system or something like that. Well, how long does it take to bring that backup and bring back the service? So what, what is the business requirement there? Another important thing is the recovery point objective. How much data can we lose? Can we, can we, can we actually take a full backup every day and then Whenever we need to restore, we can lose up to 24 hours of data. Is that something that is acceptable or not? So this is something you, you have to uh, wonder. Another very important thing is off-site backups. You probably want to be able to recover in case of a data center failure. So you could use Swift maybe. If we use backups and stream that to Swift, then we can use Swift to make sure that the backups are located somewhere else and not only in the same data center. Another thing is the backup retention plan. So we, how, many, how long do we need to keep full, backup, keep full backups? Incremental backups. Um, how do we need to da do daily incrementals or hourly incrementals? Another thing is, in order to reach into, to the recovery point objective, is to do like point in time recovery can be done with MySQL binary logs. You need to backup them as well to be able to go back to any point in time in, in case that somebody deleted some wrong data, for example. Maybe you need to skip that and then uh, uh, make sure we, we recover everything except that delete statement, for example. Another important thing is to test backups and your restore procedures. Who tests the ba their backups regularly and automatically? Not many, none. Okay, one person, good. <laughs> um, so this is, this is something very important and something that actually should be automated as well. And actually with this way that we take backups now with uh, backups to Swift, which I'll really demo very, very soon, um, um, it makes it a lot easier to be able to test the backups, see if the backups are working correctly or not. So what type of backup solutions exist? So we've got LVM snapshots. So if you're using LVM, you can take an LVM snapshot mount that snapshot, copy the data over. But the problem is that there's a write performance impact. There's a big write performance impact, and like I think it's a ballpark here, 10 times slower in terms of writes. So this is, this is not exaggerated. This is, this is true. So if you have a write-heavy environment, LVM snapshots will not do it for you. If you think about MySQL dump, which is a logical backup, so we convert all the data to SQL statements. So imagine having to load that data if we're talking about Two gigabytes, it's going to be fast. If we're talking about a terabyte, it might take a long time, even a week, to restore that single threaded doing SQL statement by SQL statement. So this is something that uh, is very, very slow to restore on larger data sets. We can back up a node if we're talking about a Galera cluster. So we can say this node will take a backup from there. Uh, you can actually shut it down, copy the data files, start it up again. Or you can use a replica, so using master-slave replication or master-master, depending on what you use. So this does require extra hardware. You need to take that replica out of production uh, and things like that. Another thing is disk subsystem uh, snapshots. So some hardware like SAN supports snapshots. The thing I can say there, it's block level. You cannot have fine grain control on which part you want to backup, which part you want to restore. You kind of have to restore everything, make sure that that works, and then you can maybe extract some data out of it. So it's a lot more difficult. And also, a file system snapshot, yes, if you're using InnoDB, it is durable, so you can expect that the database will recover and it will, be, uh, will have no data loss, depending on some settings, of course. But keep in mind that if you want point-in-time recovery, some settings need to be correctly configured, or you might have a corrupted database anyway if you're using such uh, snapshots. So that's kind of what there is, but what I want to talk about is Procona Extra Backup. So this is an open-source, free 
completely free MySQL hot backup solution for non-blocking InnoDB backups. So we're talking about InnoDB here. Um, ExtraDB is also mentioned, so ExtraDB is Procona ExtraDB. It's actually a, a patched version of InnoDB with some extra features, diagnostics, performance improvements, and so on. It supports Procona Server, Oracle MySQL, MariaDB. So it supports any flavor of MySQL. So it's not limited to Procona Server. So what features does it have? So again, online, you can do multi-threaded backups, so file per file. You can compress and encrypt in the same command, and you can do it multi-threaded as well, each of them. Um, you can stream backups. We have this for a long time already. We can stream backups from one node to the other node. We don't have to copy it to some local disk first and then copy it to the backup server. We can do it over the network. Using Netcat, SSH, different things can be done. Uh, and that's where the backup to Swift also comes into play. We can do incremental backups, delta backups, however you want it. So it is a physical backup that is being taken of the raw data files, the raw table spaces of InnoDB. You can do partial backup, partial restore. You can say, I only want to restore these files, only these directories. That is no problem. That works. So what we added in extra backup version 2.3, the latest version at this moment is 2.2, is support for streaming to Swift. Um, so we've acted, added a tool called XB Cloud. Uh, it also has S3 support, but I shouldn't say that too loud here, I heard. Um, but OK, it's currently in development. We are expected to release a beta very soon. Um, but soon, I mean maybe this week, next week, somewhere like that. Um, also, I just heard that it is planned to be in Trove uh, for database as a uh, service in, in Liberty. So this is going to be uh, great to have a feature for that for Trove as well. And now I'm going to kind of do a demo. I have screenshots as well for if the demo doesn't work, because demos usually don't work. Uh, but I'll try. So let's, let's have a look. Um, sorry, I will also copy paste things, just, just to be sure that I don't make any mistakes. So first of all, I've got like, is it readable for everybody? Who cannot read it? Somebody. OK, let me make it a bit bigger. Is it OK now? Perfect. OK. So I have a command here, Swift stat, um, just checking, can we authenticate using a user backup and the key, sorry, not to save, backup. So we are doing a Swift stack VIP. I have a Swift stack setup, and I have a dev stack setup. So very simple, very, very lightweight. Um, I'm running this on my computer, just in case internet didn't work. So we can see we can authenticate. Um, authentication works. So what I want to do is I kind of want to list the files I have currently for that user. So I have a container here. So I do Swift. Uh, I can do it here. Um, here we go. So we can see, do the same thing. We do Swift list. And we can see I have a container called core backup. I created that. That's where we will take and put our backup in. Um, I also want to show you the GUI. So we kind of have uh, the Swift stack interface. So this is. Uh, one of the interfaces here. So I have a container called Core Backup. There's no files in it yet. And I also have Cyberduck, which is connected uh, to the Swift, through the Swift API. So everything is empty in the Core Backup. Um, so let us take a backup right now. So I'll just go over it quickly, because it's kind of a command that we need to run. Um, so what do we have? We are compressing the backup uh, right here. I'll highlight it. So we're compressing it. We're encrypting it using AES-256 with a very, 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 very insecure key, which we mentioned here. You can also include a key file uh, if necessary. We're streaming the backup. We're not making a copy to some file. We're streaming it using XBStream, which is extra backup stream. Uh, and we're taking a backup. This is just the command to say backup. We're piping this through XBCloud, which is the new tool that we've developed. And we are doing it in multi-threaded. Uh, uh, we'll send multiple requests through the Swift REST API uh, using Swift. So we have uh, the Swift URL here with the authentication again and the container we want to put this in. So we have full backup here. So this is just the directory name I'm using. So maybe you should use a date, um, time. Maybe you should make a full uh, directory. So there's so, still some work that you should do depending on your requirements on how to put it in there, uh, what retention policy you have, and things like that. So if I press Enter, a backup will be taken. So you can see it's basically taking the inodb files, uh, copying them, doing the online backup, piping that through XB Cloud, and immediately put, putting it into Swift. So if I go to the interface here, this is uh, the directory is created. Sorry if this is a little bit small. Uh, 
And you can see that all the directories are in there. Uh, I can do the same using the Swift GUI. Uh, I have core backup, all my files are there. So uh, what we see is we have different things. Let me just refresh while the backup is being taken. Uh, let's go into Neutron. So we have different files here, so it's using multiple files, uh, split up in multiple files, and we have the IBD files, which is inodb table spaces, and it has the .qp ex extension, which means QPress, so QPress encryption is being, uh, compression is being used, sorry. XBcrypt is the e encryption that we use, so it's a compressed and encrypted file, so each of them is compressed and encrypted. So you can see we have a full backup of all, all our tables at this moment. So very easy, just one command and it streams it, no spooling necessary, uh, no intermediate spooling necessary to be able to put it in backup. So depending on your configuration of Swift, you will have multiple copies, offsite might be in multiple data centers, whatever you configure in, in Swift, Swift stack, um, the data will, will be arranged uh, over there. So we have our full backup, um, and I kind of want to also do a restore, of course, and uh, I'm just going to remove everything here. So I'm going to do restore the data to slash restore. So this is just xbcloud get that I'm actually doing. Just one moment, I don't want it to execute immediately. Um, yep, so what do we do? It's the same instead of xbcloud put, we do xbcloud get. And then we say the container that we want. So we have core backup here, and we want to take it from the directory full backup. And then we stream that through xbstream again, um, and we put it into slash restore. So if I enter that, uh, there's a little typo there, um, but this is, this is still a very alpha release. Um, I'm not using the latest one. This is the one that worked um, a couple of weeks ago, and I left it like that. So <laughs> I didn't want to upgrade this morning. So you can see it's copying all the files, taking everything from Swift, um, and putting it into slash restore. So the database here, dev stack, nothing much happened. Um, so yeah, everything is done. So if I go to slash restore, you can see we have the same amount of files here. We're not ready yet, so we're not ready to just use it for MySQL because it's still compressed and encrypted. At this moment, it's not supported to automatically decompress and decrypt it, um, but I, we've been talking about adding support for that. Not sure when that will be, though. Um, so the next thing we need to do is do that de uh, decrypt and um, decompression. So we can do that. We do that here. It will do, uh, currently it's doing some cut pipes through the different commands to be able to do that. So it's doing this, should be finished shortly. Um, and then we have an extracted backup. Now the, a backup by itself, an extra backup, if you use extra backup already, um, is not ready to be used. You cannot just run MySQL on it yet. You need to prepare it. So this is the second phase you always need to do. So basically, uh, you need to do dash dash prepare and say I want to prepare the data in slash restore. That is it. Now keep in mind, uh, if you do incrementals, this would be the full backup. We can then say we take from XBA Cloud, so from Swift, we take an incremental, we apply the incremental on the full, and then we'll prepare it. So these are things that we can do as well. So this would be a multi-step process if you use incremental backups. So we'll do the prepare. So what actually basically happens is an inodb recovery. That's the implementation of how Percona Extra Backup works. And that's it. It prepared it. Everything's ready. And we should be able to just start MySQL on this. And this is just a regular MySQL data directory. So you just replace the data directory, start MySQL, and we're good to go. And we have all the data recovered. Now, because we are using inodb file per table by default, we can do it like a partial restore. We can, for example, say, oh, we want uh, VIP services.ibd, so you can say only, only recover that uh, file uh, or that table, so we can say, uh, okay, we only want a subset of the data. So that, that's basically it um, on how to do it. So it's a couple of steps. So in the slides, um, I, have, I have exactly the same, so you could see how we do it, the process that we do it. Uh, so that is something that if you want to use it. So currently, this is a 2.3 alpha. You need to take the trunk from GitHub to be and compile it yourself at this moment. So if you just hold on for a small amount of time, you'll be able to download packages and just install it on, on whatever distribution you're using. So this is basically it. Um, do you have anything to add, Chris? Just a, uh, I'll, yes. add, I'll add one comment just to clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pieces is, is uh, as Kenny was saying, directory, and you saw that full backup directory. So think if you're a Swift guy, uh, that's a container, right? So where we were backing up uh, all, all of the files from uh, Percona XRDB, 
That was he created and and uh, and dumped all that stuff into a container. The UI that you're looking at, if you're not familiar with Swift Stack, the UI you're looking at here is a simple, extremely simple um, browser-based kind of console into uh, the containers, accounts and containers that uh, are inside of this cluster. Uh, we have, this is a very common way, way to kind of go interact with and put a little bit of data uh, into a Swift, Swift Stack cluster when you get this up and running, kind of in a POC type of environment. Uh, can you use CyberDuck as well? It's another way to, uh, to view uh, what's in there commonly. Um, you would be interacting with the Swift Stack cluster, the Swift cluster with some application, exactly like Kenny did today with Percona or Imagine your other uh, apps and things that are out there. The other UI you didn't see from Swift Stack, uh, which you certainly can, and either in the uh, workshop or just by going to our website and, and uh, signing up for a free trial, um, you can see the management UI that kind of controls getting all this stuff set up, which we did offline and, and didn't have the time oh, to, uh, to mess with here. So I think that was it on that last slide. Uh, I know we'll uh, um, we, we switch back to the uh, slide here in a second. Yep, we'll do that. Um, we've got uh, a couple of links, obviously, to the Percona site, to a Swift Stack site, uh, to our workshop. If you want to sign up for the Swift workshop, that's the middle one there. Um, if you if you can't read that link, just come find me, and uh, we can get you some details on that. Any questions? I think the, uh, the the way to do this is either to go to the microphone or shout it out. We'll try and repeat back. Uh, for the recording. Any questions about uh, what we covered here today? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> questions. Always nice. So I'm just curious, yes. is the, uh, granted this is with extra backup, but is the yeah. InnoBackupX uh, wrapper script, will that be updated to allow this as well? So, good question. So you're used to Procona extra backup. So in a new feature in extra backup 2 to 3 as well is to get rid of NO backup X completely. Okay. And you're smiling, so yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so yeah, all the functionality is now implemented in extra backup. So there's only one command, no wrapper around it anymore. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, very good. Thank you, Kenny. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you.